Hello, I'm Angus Scott and welcome to The Debrief. It's great to have you with us. It's another properly international show today with contributions from the US, Italy, the Netherlands and Cheltenham. We'll get on to the latest transfer news very shortly. Fabrizio Romano will be with us to give us his spin on the market. Stand by for the transfer guru. And as ever, Ben Jacobs is with me. And I'm wondering just how long you're staying in the States, Ben. I can't stay any longer because if I do, I'm not going to be able to fit on the plane due to the volume deep dish pizza that has been consumed over the last two weeks. <laughs> I'm not surprised. And he is in the Windy City. So that's very suitable. Well, today we will discuss whether this is the tightest top four contest ever in the Premier League. And to do it with us is a global footballing superstar. He was twice World Footballer of the Year and wasn't just one of the greatest of his generation. He's one of the greatest of all time. It is, of course, Rude Hullet. This is a difficult one to call for the top four, not necessarily for the title, because you might say, well, Man City are the side to beat. But look at the top four and how many sides will be pushing for it this year. Now, what you've seen is that uh, City had, uh, it was so powerful and then nobody could stop them that it made the other uh, teams more hungry to get the right players in order to beat the City. Now, this weekend it already started with Arsenal uh, and they beat, the, of course, it was, they, were, they were fortunate to do so. But uh, nevertheless, um, everybody tries to do hard uh, to, to beat City. It's going to be difficult. Uh, it's going to be maybe a, a, a year of surprises. We don't know. I, 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 I don't. I wouldn't put my money on nobody at the moment because so many teams change so much that it's it's hard to 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 find out. You know, if they are capable of challenging City. Let's have a look at your previous clubs, Rude. You know, uh, a bit of Chelsea, a bit of Newcastle. I, I bet you would have. I would have bet you would have loved a bit of the money that that Newcastle have now got. Of course, you you know you went to Chelsea and and Ken Bates was. He was generous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just, uh, Ken was was generous. He he uh, the, the players that I wanted, he gave me the money to to, to buy. Of course, it was a different market to those days. It was not as much as it was. Uh, Nowadays, I think that uh, a lot of players are overpaid. I think a lot of them, uh, considering the talent that they show every week. But you know, it's a different market, different, uh, different era. Um, but, uh, so therefore, I, I I'm very proud of what uh, Newcastle have achieved because they have achieved it with players that mm, they are not at the top five of players that people would choose that makes it even better what they've done and i think that what how he has done he bought the players that he needed for his team he didn't buy players just for the name of it and that i i think i i i really appreciate in what he's doing at the moment if you see for instance a dutchman botman was not very fake but he did well he asserted really really well in that so for that reason, I am uh, I'm very, very, very pleased of what Newcastle, they have at least an identity. And uh, with other teams, you see sometimes too much, they go for uh, just a name. And therefore, that is not always a, a, a key to success. Rude, you bring up two really interesting things there. We'll talk about, go back to Newcastle in, in just a moment. You feel there are too many ordinary players in the Premier League being paid yeah. too much money? Yeah. And it's too easy for them? Uh, yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, I think that uh, there's, you know, if I see players that, uh, you know, earn a lot of money, but I, I don't think they, they they are up to that standard. I'm not going to name names, of course, because that's <laughs> obvious. But I think that there's a lot of players who are too are overrated. And, and and they play in the Premier League. Uh, nevertheless, the Premier League is, of course, the biggest stage in Europe at the moment. So therefore, a lot of people want to play in the Premier League, but not necessarily the best players on there, because beforehand, the really best players were in other countries. Neymar, Messi, uh, were all at other uh, in other uh, leagues. In Spain, there was a lot of. Also, they had good players with the best. They had the best players. 
Therefore, a, for the Premier League, it 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 has it, it you, you need to buy the players that you need to to become better, and uh, and that's that's not about names, but uh, about about players that you really believe. So I think that Newcastle, I think for me, is an example of a team that succeeded in that to buy players that they really really need. Chelsea, on the other hand, it's the opposite. They bought so many players. I can I think they could play three teams. <laughs> 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 Too many players. Uh, Pochettino doesn't even know what to do with all these players. And then some of them are good, eh? Not all these players are bad players, but it doesn't mean that all good players can play along with them. So therefore, you need to buy things that you really, really need. And sometimes it can be a player that is maybe not as obvious, but is still a good player. We'll talk about Liverpool in a moment and Arsenal as well, but Chelsea specifically, identities, one thing they need, Rude. Goals is another. Nico Jackson's come in. He's looked very positive in preseason. Amanda Broyer is there as well. But do they need a flagship number nine on top of that to stand a realistic chance of pushing to get back into the Champions League? Look, it doesn't depend on the striker. You know, Lewandowski stopped it very well, but was not the key for the success of Barcelona. Not at all. So therefore, you need you need a good team. And I say always, if you build a team, you build it from the defense up. A lot of people always start with, with the striker. No, if you build a hat, you don't start with the roof. You start with the fundamental. You start with the fundamental. Well, it's important to get all the right players at the right clubs, and there's so much business going on at the moment. As ever, every week, we get hold of our transfer guru, <laughs> Mauricio Romano, and uh, let's catch up with him a little bit earlier. I had a word with our transfer guru. Fabrizio, as ever, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, let's get on with uh, all the news we need to hear. Will Chelsea finally sign Caicedo this week? Let's see, uh, because I spent the whole summer saying next week, next week, <laughs> next week, and it's been a I very know. long saga, so I don't want to tell Chelsea fans something that then is not happening, but for sure new contacts will take place. We expect Chelsea to speak again to Brighton and probably, to improve their proposal for Moises Caicedo. Brighton have been very clear also in the recent days. They are not going to accept £80 million. So the bid has to be improved if they want to sign Moises Caicedo. But I think the most important thing is what happened on Sunday, uh, when the player, in very clear way, was not part of Brighton's squad officially for an Armstrong injury. But in the reality, I'm told from people close to the player, because Moises Caicedo wants to send a message to Brighton and to say, I want to live. I want to try a different experience and he wants to go to Chelsea. He agreed terms with Chelsea already in May. So that's the feeling on player side, that the message was very clear. He wants to go to Chelsea. And so it's now up to clubs. I think new contacts will take place and could be an important week. Is Tyler Adams a possibility as well? Yeah, it's a separate deal at the moment. So it's not uh, plan B or that kind of situation. At the moment, it's two separate, se separate negotiations that Chelsea are, uh, are discussing, uh, in this case, with uh, Leeds. They will have discussions with Leeds this week because they already spoke to the player side. It was last week. The player would be, obviously, uh, keen on joining uh, Chelsea, really attracted by the project. But now it's on Chelsea to decide whether they want to activate the £20 million relegation clause into the contract of Tyler Adams or maybe wait a bit more. But for sure, he's one of the names they have in the list, one of the players they appreciate. Uh, and so let's see how they will decide to proceed if they want to trigger the close, if they want to negotiate with Leeds, if they want to discuss about terms of the deal. But for sure, Tyler Adams is one of the players they have in the list at Chelsea. And as far as Romeo Lavia is, is concerned, are Liverpool still favourites for him? Yeah, Liverpool are favourites uh, because they've been bidding for him for, uh, for weeks, because they remain in contact with people close to the player and with Southampton. Chelsea are always there. Chelsea are always there because it's a player that, as we mentioned many times, uh, is very appreciated by people into the board, especially Joe Shields, as I mentioned many times, the man who almost created Romeo as a player uh, at Southampton and before at Manchester City Academy. So it's obvious this connection, but at the moment, sources believe that Liverpool remain the favourites. Uh, the expectation is still for Liverpool to try again, to approach Southampton again, to try and win the new bid. The first one was £37 million rejected. The second was £42 million rejected. Now I think Liverpool will try 
again for uh, for Romeo Lavia, also because the player is keen on the move. So it's on Liverpool now, but I think this week they have to accelerate because they need players in that position. And I wonder whether Manchester City will move for another centre midfield player. We know they did try for Casado. Yeah, at the moment, honestly, for, for Man City, I think the focus is on the winger more than on the midfielder. So they want to replace Riyad Maretz because formerly they replaced Gundogan with Mateo Kovacic, of course, is a different kind of player. But uh, in terms of numbers, uh, they signed Mateo Kovacic. And so that's how they have one more player in the uh, in the midfield. And so now the focus after Josko Gvardiol, which was the total priority of the summer for Manchester City, the idea is to replace Riyad Maretz. And they appreciate Michael Olise. They appreciate Jeremy Doku from Bren. So they have a list of names for the new winger for, uh, for Pep Guardiola. And then for the midfielder, we will see at the moment is not something uh, close or imminent. Uh, they thought of Gabri Vega. It was more than one month ago. They had some contacts with people close to the player, but then they decided probably to go for a different kind of, uh, of player in that position. So at the moment, it's not something that they are uh, actively pursuing at Manchester City. Let's see. At the moment, it's something that we have to keep an eye on until the end of the window, the midfielder for City, but it's not something in yet. And Arsenal are focusing on goalkeepers, it seems. Now, is, is a Raya deal close? Yeah, it's close. It's not, it's not done yet, but it's close. They still have to discuss something. We know Brentford are uh, very strong in negotiations, so it's never easy to negotiate with them. And Tottenham know that very well because they wanted David Raya. Then they decided to go for uh, for Guillermo Vicario because the negotiation with Brentford was very complicated. Now Arsenal are in direct contact with Brentford. There is a discussion ongoing. Even today, while I'm speaking, they are discussing about details of the deal. Arsenal made a bid last week, £20 million pounds plus three in the don'ts. Arsenal have an agreement with the player because David Raya wants to play for Arsenal. So now they are discussing with Brentford. They are trying to find the best way to make this deal happen. But I think it's a very concrete possibility to see the deal done this week. And therefore, is the Matt Turner to Nottingham Forest deal done? Yeah, it's done. He's having a medical today at Nottingham Forest. The player agreed terms last week and the deal was already almost done between Friday and Saturday. Today, uh, Arsenal and Nottingham Forest have been in touch again to uh, finalise all the details of the deal. It's a £7 million deal plus some add-ons up to £9-10 million for uh, Matt Turner. The player agreed immediately. Also, we have to see what happens with Tim Anderson now because uh, Matt Turner is the priority target. So now they have Matt Turner at the club, but sources believe that there is a chance they will all so open talks again with Manchester United for Dean Anderson. They've been discussing for weeks and weeks. No agreement on the formula of the deal. Nottingham Forest wanted a loan with buy option that could become obligation. So mandatory close in case of some number of appearances at Nottingham Forest. Man United wanted a guaranteed sale of the player. So that's why there was a distance between the two clubs. But I think new round of talks will take place very soon also for Dean Anderson. And we're discussing... Um the top four race being probably the toughest ever in the Premier League. With that in mind, will we see any more big spending from Newcastle this window, do you expect? I think it could be a possibility for them to sign at least one more player. Uh, of course, they already invested invested very big on Barnes, Livramento and, uh, and Sandro Tonali. But the idea to do something else is still in, in their mind. Uh, it also depends on the outgoings. We know how crucial it is, as Eddie Howe is playing many times for Newcastle, to sell players before signing new players. So uh, this has to be the domino at, at Newcastle. But it's a possibility. For example, they had conversations with uh, Dizasi, who now joined Chelsea, but is one of the players they were appreciating as potential new centre. So um, this shows how they are having, obviously, conversations and they want to be ready in case there is an opportunity. At the moment, it's not something that close or imminent, also because they're still finalizing the deal for Tino Livramento, who is completing the final part of medical today. But I think we have to keep the door open for new incomings at Newcastle till the end of the win. Well, elsewhere, as far as the Saudis are concerned, is, is Joao Felix to Al-Hilal possible? Yeah, it's possible. I think he's a... Uh, Plan B for Joe Felix. Uh, his priority, from what I'm told, remains to join Barcelona. His dream is to join Barcelona. So let's see what happens there. But Joao would love to join Barca. He's been very clear in the interview I had with him. Uh, he was really, really strong in his statement by saying, I want to go to Barca. So this remains the player desire. He wants to become a Barcelona player, but it depends on Barca or European clubs. He wants to continue in Europe. In case Barcelona will tell him in the next days, we can't make it happen due to the financial reasons, 
keep an eye on Alilal because Alilal are prepared to offer Atletico Madrid what they want in terms of loan deals, so also for one season and then letting Joao return to European football next summer. But also the discussion with the player is ongoing between, because the manager, Jorge Jesus, is Portuguese. He had direct conversations uh, with Joao Felix more than one time. He's pushing to have Joao Felix in Saudi and so it's a concrete possibility. But his, his preferred choice for Felix would be to stay in Europe. Yeah, the priority would be to stay to stay in Europe and to continue European football, especially with uh, uh, with Barcelona. So he would love to go to Barca, otherwise European football in general. But Al Hilal is a concrete option to keep an eye on till the till the end of the window because they are there. They are prepared to give him and to give Atletico Madrid what they want. And is it true that Victor uh, Osimen is a target as well? Is a target, yes, it's true for Alilal. Is a player they like. They are trying for many players because, for example, they had a conversation with Mitrovic, but at the moment it's something in standby because they are trying for other players. Uh, they are having a conversation for Victor Osiman, it's true, they are trying, but at the moment they have no agreement with Napoli and Napoli are still trying to extend the contract of Victor Osiman. So let's see what happens there, but it's true that he's a target for Alilal. 100% guaranteed. And then they also tried last weekend for Jonathan David, for example, because Alilal also approached the agents of Jonathan David, but the player is not that convinced about making Saudi move. He wants to continue in Europe. So I think we will see something big from Alilal in the next weeks. Uh, it is possible, though, he could sign a, a new Napoli deal, though. Yeah, it's possible. It's possible because Napoli remain confident, remain optimistic, and they offered a very important contract. They could include a buyout clause into the contract for, for Victor Osimhen, but Alilal are still there. Behind the scenes, Alilal are still trying, are offering incredible amount of money to the player, and they are still trying to convince Napoli, but Napoli at the moment are rejecting their proposals. So I think this Osimhen story is still open, but I would give absolutely a chance to Napoli to extend the contract. That's brilliant. Fabrizio, as ever, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks for catching up with us and we look forward to speaking to you next week. Thank you and see you next week. Fabrizio, with all the uh, relevant information and all the gossip, um, that's uh, really interesting as, as far as Chelsea and, and Newcastle and all the other clubs are concerned. I'll let, I'll go back to something that you were saying, Rude. Look, when you were a manager, we're talking about identity. What did you want the identity of your footballing side to be? That I want... I want to play football. I remember in the first months when I was coached and with a new team, uh, the crowd didn't like so much the way we kept the ball because they want the ball to be in the channels, the ball as quick as possible forward. It took them a while in order to understand what we tried to do. We tried to play from the back. We tried to play into midfield in order to get as much triangles as possible and to play our football. So therefore, it, my philosophy is that you need to have two good center halves. Center half who gets the ball because they touch the ball more than anyone else. They start the attack starts. If they can play football and they can anticipate, that makes it already uh, much easier. Then you go to your midfield. Your midfield needs to be a player who connects the defense with the striker. And if you have players like that who can do that, then you can go to your striker. So your spine is the most important thing. And that's where you try to find the right player. Not necessarily always the best, but the best that, that suits each other. And sometimes it can be somebody who nobody thought. I remember in my days, I needed to have a good center half. So LeBeuf, he could play for that. He was excellent. For me, the man that had to be there in front of him was Dennis White. Dennis, in the beginning, was always playing as the crazy gang, trying to kick everybody. And so I said, you have to stop with that. I can't have you playing like that. Yeah, but you only want foreigners in the team and you want me to get out. I said, no, I don't want that. I want you to play football. And if you play the football that you can do, maybe he's going to be in the national team. He was laughing at me. He was laughing. He didn't even want to speak with me in the beginning. Then later on, he called me to be at, his, at my house. I said, come to my house and I will explain to you. And I've said it to him. If you stop kicking people and start playing football, can you do that? If you do that, you are my captain. And he said, yeah, okay, I can do it. I said, no, okay. And th the rest is history. So therefore, somebody who people think, how can you have... No, Dennis Wise was a good player. 
only if he was thinking about football. He was one of our, my most important players. Why do you think, though, he had that mentality in the first place? Because of where he came from, and that's the so he, he, he yeah, he was yeah, tackling players, getting crazy with it. I said, no, I don't want you to do it. You are a much better player. And by the way, uh, I I admired a lot Wimbledon at that moment because we played against Wimbledon. Wimbledon was a very clever team, by the way, because everybody underestimated them. They were very, very good. The way what they did was excellent. And uh, all the standard situations from them were excellent. So they prepared themselves in a different way. So I noticed, but the, the game that we wanted to play was different. I remember I bought Graham Lasso. We had training sessions and things like that. <laughs> I'm like, half an hour. Yeah. With Baba Poyet came to me and he says, Rudy, Rudy, can you play with him? He all the time kicked the ball in the channel. I get stiff neck, kick the ball in the air. Can you please talk with me? <laughs> and Graham, I would talk with Graham. I said, look, we tried to play the path the ball for each other. And Graham did. He was an excellent player. But in the beginning, he was kicking the ball all the time. <laughs> well, what you have to understand is, you, you, look, you didn't revolutionize it, but, you, you know, at the time I remember you saying, look, we want to play sexy football, and people thought it was a joke, but you wanted to play football the way that you'd played in your career. I wanted to play football. I wanted to keep the ball. I wanted to. If you have the ball, you have more possibility to score a goal, okay? So, therefore, and that's the philosophy I am raised up in Holland, uh, you know, and uh, we all know uh, total football of Cruyff and Michels, so that's a little bit our base, you know, how we want to play for. Doesn't mean that you're always going to win with it, but I think we made our mark in, in, in football with the Dutch way of playing for. Still now, still Pep, still plays the football that Joel Cruyff was practicing. He believes in that system. So therefore, it's, 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 it's a way of playing football. And I think that, yeah, everybody loves the way plays with his team. I think that the good thing for me is that attacking football always thrives. We saw it with Liverpool, 4-3-3, attacking football. We saw it now with City, attacking football. So it with Chelsea, attacking football thrives. We want that. We, we as a spectator wants that. And of course, there are also opposites towards that who have been successful as well. And, but the, nevertheless, I, where I come, I like, to, I like to play attacking football. If I can, if I don't have, if I don't have the resources, if I don't have the players to do so, then sometimes I have to think of, of something else. And I think that that's why I admire also Mourinho, because Mourinho, he understood that sometimes the opposition is maybe better than you. How can I still win a game? And that's another thing. So therefore, Mourinho was a different way of approaching the game, but was the right way as well. He managed a lot of times with players that were not that good, at least to get successful. When he had the players, he played more attacking football. When he was with Chelsea, he plays more attacking football. So therefore... He adapts himself on the people that he has, on the players that he has, and plays his football with that. And I think that is also a way of being successful. So, so therefore, I admire Mourinho very, very much. And uh, yeah, and when you have the players, if you can buy for 500 million players like Pep, then you can buy the players that you need. It took a while. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> I think he spent something like that. Uh, on, on, on five, six players he bought in defense to play, the, to play the football. And then all of a sudden, he gets a player that he didn't see for a while, Stones, he plays him in midfield. So all of a sudden, something comes out of the high head and it's like, hey, that's the salute. While he had that player already for a long time, man. So, yeah. so therefore, as a coach, you always try to figure something out in order to uh, be dominant over the opposition. So attacking football 
is key in your mind when it's possible? In my mind, if I have to play it, if I don't have to play it, I have to think of something di different. Sometimes I have to play more defense in order to, to fight my way and, and, and not lose the game. You know, there are, for instance, if you, if you win, if, if you have a Champions League, there are games that you didn't play that well in, right. and you were lucky, but, you know, on the trophy, it doesn't say how you want it. Eh? It's on your face. It's on it. yes. And sometimes you have to think of that as well. Nice. Remember how many times people talked about Pep. Yeah, you think too much, you wanted to be too clever, and you lost the final. A lot of times that happened. And 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 so, so sometimes you need to do something else in order to win the game. And now I think I was particularly happy for City that they won the, the trouble, especially for Pep, because the football that he plays is difficult. It's the most difficult thing in the world to play like that. So in order to play that, it has to be perfect most of the time. One mistake if you play from the back. One mistake, and it happened a lot of times. A mistake from the back, interception, goal. So that is the that is the, that is a little bit the risk that you are taking. Uh, but you need to have players to understand when to take that risk, and that is the most difficult thing. What Pep plays from the defense is the easy. It's it's easier to destroy a house than to build a house. So. If we now look at Spurs in that context, they've come from Antonio Conte ball, very defensive minded. They'll transition to Ange Postacoglu ball, which is very attack minded. How do you see them faring this season? Because look, is a big look, I think that I think that uh, Conte, you know, his philosophy is good. He has a good philosophy because he has been successful with Juventus, of course. And he, he attacked. He did it also with Chelsea. He attacked also. So I think that the, the, the football that he wanted to play with the players didn't match with the players he had. That's why he was so frustrated. It didn't, it didn't, didn't match uh, the team and the tactics that he wanted. He applied it for so many times. He tried it. He tried it, but it didn't match. It can happen. That's why always thinking of a tactic that works for every team that is not the case it doesn't it doesn't i can i can win with chelsea in sexy football but i can play with another team i have to play something different because i don't have the players to do so then i then as a coach i have to adapt myself because i think that the players are more important than the tactics you adjust yourself to the players that you have and you need to let the players play something that is best for them, not for you. So you can't change them, Rude. You don't think if 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 it doesn't suit them, if you have the players doesn't suit the way you want to play, then you have to adapt yourself. You cannot all the time apply something that you think they can play. If I don't have the money to change that team, then I have to do it with the player that I have. And it can be something totally different. So uh, it, it can be. So therefore, you need always to be aware that it's not you. You, it's the players that make you the coach. The players. So, so someone like, um, you know, uh, say at Arsenal, the Mikel Arteta, okay, he's, he's had three years to change the players that he wants because now he's brought in the players to play in the way that he wants to play. So he's had that amount of time to change it. So if you bring in the right players, you can do it. But if he's been stuck with the players he had when he inherited the club, you're saying it would never have worked. The thing is that uh, last year he did an amazing job because I think for a long, long period, it went really, really well. Everybody can could, could tell you that it was fantastic to watch. Okay? Then... They came in a situation that have never been. At least a lot of players had never been. And that is pressure. And they couldn't cope with it. For some reason, they could. And I tell you one thing. To be the chaser is much easier than to be on top. The only one who could handle that was Tiger Wood. 
He loved to be on top all the time. He didn't care. Some people like to chase. And I think it was easier for the chases in order to than, than, than it was for us. The, the, the thing now is for us is that the player, he has the players that he wanted now. So now he needs to win. <laughs> I still think it, 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 I, I admire what he done with us. Really does. But, you know, there are six teams who want to win the championship. <laughs> it's difficult. And they all are impatient. All of them are impatient. They all want an immediate success. It's not going to be like that. How long did Pep do to win the championship? How long? It, it, it's, not, it's not that easy. And he had a big club. But for all these coaches on the top six, it's going to be a you know, very difficult year. If you see in the beginning of the season how fresh they come, nice pan and everything, <laughs> black hair and everything, well, they made them look. <laughs> they lose all their hair, they look grumpy. <laughs> this is what it is. This is the life of a coach. Nobody has any patience. And the thing is, with Pep, he was still in getting championships. He was still winning some cups. So therefore, that was the good thing for, for Pep. So he could continue building, continue, continue. But if you win nothing... But do you think Arteta can can say, go one better, can can hold on to it, can really challenge Man City at, at the end of the season? To. Yeah, but he needs to. He had been on top, okay? For such a long time. He needs to. He knows now that he has the place that he wanted. But one or seven million were right. So now you have to do it. This is the this is the year you have to do it. You have to win something. And therefore there's much more pressure on him than on City. City's difficulty is can they do it again? Are the players hungry enough to do it again? Difficult, eh? It's a lot of things. Then you have Liverpool, who once they have been successful such a long time, and now all of a sudden they need to, whoa, can we have the players? Can we do the thing? Can we do the same? Difficult. And they have all the players now, they need to be replaced. Can they be replaced immediately? Ooh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one eh, to maintain. I know that feeling. It's tough to stay on top. Ruth, just a quick word on Urian Timber, no doubt a player that yeah. I've seen quite a bit of. I thought he was Arsenal's best performer in the Community Shield win. We'll hear a lot this season about Declan Rice and Kai Havertz, but could Timber be key to Arsenal winning the Premier League? It was funny. He, he played as a left back. He's not a left back. He could be a right back. In the youth, he plays as a right back and he's a centre half. I, myself, I had doubts in the beginning if he would play as a centre-half in the Premier League because he's not that tall. Nevertheless, he's a very good player. On the ball, he is fantastic. He's easy on the ball. He's the Left back? That's a situation I've never seen him play. Never, ever. So, therefore, we're going to see. I hope, I hope he will be successful. But if he's going to play centre-half, I don't know. Let's talk about Liverpool then. You mentioned them a moment ago. They've lost their captain, Jordan Henderson, to Saudi Arabia. Fabinho's gone as well. Soboslai looks like a good profile and signing. A lot of money spent on him. Alexis McAllister, 35 million. That was an excellent piece of business for Liverpool as well. Have they done enough so far for you to suggest that they can get back challenging? Look... You hope so. The players that left have been very important, especially midfield. And and, and your midfield is also the heart of the, of the team a little bit. You know, if your midfield can really work hard, because that's what you need to do. It's do. You need to work hard, put pressure on the opposition. It's it's it's, it's a lot. Can they do it? We, I, I don't know. I, I just have to give them a chance to see what's going on in this season. I, I, I really, I really, I really need, I'm curious to it because up front it all look really, really good up front, but defensively ooh, they had some problems as well, and so therefore, can they have that same system of play on behalf of the opposition and put the pressure? 
that depends on the strikers and the midfielders especially. Can they dog the opposition so hard that they can get the ball back? Can also the last four, can they handle it to play with 40 yards behind you? That's also something. In well, the part they could do it. The question of you know how much of Liverpool's performance depends on Virgil van Dijk that you know, was so instrumental in, in their decent performances and yeah. title and their title win. And he was off the boil by his standards last year. And how important you think he might be in in kick starting Liverpool's sort of revival as it were. Look, I have been very critical in Holland about Van Dijk. Simply because I think he's the, one of the best players. I'm not gonna moan about other players. He's the best player. I want him to play well. I want him, and I demand from him because he can. I'm not going to ask something from him that he that doesn't have. You said it, you mentioned it itself. It was the off to you that it didn't go well with Liverpool, also because in defense, something changed. I hope that this year he will, uh, he will, he will prove me wrong. I really do. Because I, I, I need him also as a good player for the national team. Because in the national team, also, we had. Lots of problems also defensively. So therefore, I, 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 yeah, I, I want him to play well. I hope he does. I really hope he does because, like I said, he's the most important player. He's captain now. He has responsibility now also for the defense. So I hope he will really, really do it. But that depends on him. And the thing is, if he accepts the, uh, the critics and acknowledge it, it's much easier for him. Because then you can work on it. If you don't see it, if you think that everybody is wrong, then it's going to be a difficult task for him. But I, I believe in it. I believe I, I, I will stay on him because I think he's one of the best players. Not because I don't like him. Oh, I like him. But I want him to play as he can. But after the injury, it was a different uh, Van Dijk than before. And what it is, he's the only one who can who can resolve this problem. So therefore, I hope he proves this year that I'm wrong. I was and right. I was still right. <laughs> you, you're but always right, Ruth. Right. <laughs> that he can say to me, did you see it now? Yes, that's what I want. I am, you know, if, if he plays like he always he can play, I'm the biggest fan of him. And do you feel he's got it in his character to prove Rude Hullet wrong? I oh yeah, he has it. He doesn't need to do it for me. Eh? I don't. I don't care. You know, I, he just he, he doesn't for himself. If you acknowledge the fact and everybody sees it that you didn't play that well, and what the reason is for that, and you resolve that, oh, fantastic! Fantastic for Liverpool, fantastic for the national team, everything. How would you manage him, though, Rude, or what advice for Jurgen Klopp? Because if you have that kind of player, as you've alluded to, who doesn't acknowledge the reality, then as you explained with Dennis Wise, sometimes you have to up the man management to show them the true picture. Do you think Van Dijk is open to that criticism? Or do you think that the swagger and his demeanour might prevent him from seeing the reality that he, he might be past his peak. What do you think? I think that there's the swagger there. But I think that if you're playing well, you can ride the wave. But if you're not playing well, you have to adapt, especially with age. Yes, especially. I, I You know, I think he's still one of the best defenders there can be. Not that as he plays last year, of course not. But he needs to, you know, he needs to, you know, he needs to do something in order to understand why. What was the reason I didn't play perform that well? And I hope he can find it. And I hope that somebody, you know, tells him the truth, tells him. And I think that the first thing that maybe Klopp wanted is to make him captain, to make him responsible, the responsible for it. And that maybe up his performance in order to 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 deal with the two team performance. I think that that is one psychological thing that Klopp did with him in order to give him captaincy. And I hope he can he can answer to, you know, the, the, the willingness of, 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 of Klopp. I hope so. I hope it really does. Because 
I I want a good fun bag. I want it. Yeah. Let's just briefly, uh, Rude, move on. Look, someone like um, Harry Maguire has lost the captaincy. All change, all right, at Manchester United. Do you feel that we're talking about um, putting on your, you know, your imprint on the club, that that's, that's nearly there now at, at Old Trafford, bearing in mind that it has been a lot shorter time than we were talking about. I, I, I feel for him. I think that... His transfer fee way too much on his shoulder. I think for the money that he came already to, to Man United, uh, gave him a certain status that he couldn't, he couldn't, that he couldn't handle. So I feel for him. Um, then, because of the attention that it got, he he began to make also mistakes. Then they made him captain as well. And I, I think they hold that that cap did something with it. Psychological. And I think it didn't help him. So I, I, I feel a little bit for him. I, I don't think he could. He couldn't. For the demands people had, especially in, in May and Night. And he didn't play in the best team either. You can see. If the if the if from the defense the attack starts, if you make mistakes there, it's obvious. It's almost like a goalkeeper. You know, if he makes a mistake, it's awful. That's also with the center half. If he gets the ball nowadays and he doesn't do the right things or he doesn't make the uh, right decision, it's going to be it's going to be vital. And I think he has been in a couple of situations where that has been really really vital for him. And I I I, I feel for him. I really. Do. But how did you deal with how did you deal with with your moves and the massive expectation when say when you moved to to Milan that that you're expected to yeah look, had, it went it went well for you but <laughs> yeah because I didn't care I didn't care <laughs> yes I didn't care look I was just you know I was like a big kid you know I just wanted to enjoy myself and 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 I remember when I came to Milan I. You, you know me. I, I'm a happy guy. I want to talk. I want to laugh. I want to have fun. And when when I was with Milan in the beginning, and I was talking, you know, pre pre mail before the game, and I was talking and laughing, and they were, and they were looking at the coach. You see, then call it his laugh. He's not serious. <laughs> and then I played my game. And then I said, leave this guy. He doesn't care. He just wants to enjoy himself. And that's how I saw football. I got to the job, but I was serious. The longer I was in the pitch, I worked my socks off. I wanted to win. I wanted to play. If the opposition was better than me, shake hands, and that's it. But I had to have the feeling that I did everything to, to, to win it. Everything. That's what I feel so. I didn't care when I come to, to Italy. And they say, does it weigh on your shoulders that you are the most expensive player of the world? No, you didn't care. You didn't care at all. Looking ahead to uh, this season, then, Rude, as we sort of wind this up, uh, if if everyone could be as relaxed as you, it would be great. But well, I'm going to put you on the spot now and and say, what would do you think would be your your top four uh, in the Premier League? Can can Ten Hag, with the dealings that he's done, take take Manchester United, you know, even higher? Is is as as, as Someone you've seen at close hand a lot. Has he got the strength to, to sort this United side in? I don't know. I think that also uh, May United is a, is a club with a lot of demandings, you know. In the 90s, they were the club with the money, the club with the most success. But since VIR... They don't have a last quarter anymore. <laughs> no. It anymore. Have you seen it in the last quarter of the, of the game? They didn't see it. Since VAR, they don't have that anymore. Same here with Ajax also. They don't have it anymore. City's still the team to be. I think that Arsenal will be there. I hope Chelsea will be there. I, I, about Liverpool, I don't know. 
Liverpool I still don't know. I don't have a view of how they how they will be. I don't know. I, I, I have so therefore the top I think these are the top three. Chelsea is a hope, eh? also not a hope. So. Yeah. Yeah. And of course it's good for football if Liverpool is part of that as well. Okay. If that top four. Uh, yeah. Man, no Man United. Man United. I don't know about Man United. Also this year it has been they gave us hope. Yeah. And and I, but of course I hope for Ten Hag. I love I love him to be successful. But is it going to happen? So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I see them. I think they have a good squad, but there is so much going on in the Premier League. It's difficult. It's difficult. It's, it's difficult. It, 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 it is hard. I think it's going to be a hard season for for Newcastle. Not because I don't trust them, but because it's the first time they play Champions League. Champions League, Premier League, Championship, Premier League. It's not easy yet. Eh? How do they cope with it? I hope they do well. I hope. But it's going to be, I think, harder than it was last for them. But so let's see how they cope. And, uh, and I want them, I want Newcastle to be successful as well. But uh, let's see. Let's see. There's a lot of new things going on. Uh, but City still the team to be. But also, hey, Pepe, how hungry are the players? Huh? How hungry are they? They, well, you talk, you know, you talk about what Newcastle did. You know, it's tough for Manchester City having won a treble. How do you come back? And and as all players, I think, say, it's the season afterwards that's more difficult. You know, trying to keep keep up that level. If I was Pep, I would say, look, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that is the yeah. You know, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to do, but you can't do. You can only go down. You can only go down. That's my that's the difficulty with Pep is is, is is facing at the moment. And if he if he can win one of these three, would already be a great achievement. While others will see it as failure. Look, yeah, Pep. I think is one of the greatest uh, 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 coaches in the world. <laughs> yeah, with the predictions yeah. are almost impossible. So I'm gonna put myself out there, Rude, and then we're gonna force Angus on the spot as well. So. Is yes. purely our predictions. He's got to make some bold statements as well. I think everyone's in agreement that it's one Manchester City. I think you're nuts to say that they're not the favourites to win the Premier League. Interestingly for me, I think we're going to see a Liverpool resurgence, which is probably the controversial thing in my rankings because I'm going to put Liverpool two, not Arsenal. I think Arsenal will be a comfortable three. So we're essentially, in my mind, going to have one, two, three, that with maybe five games to go. But is that enough for Arsenal? Yeah, I think so. Because, you know, Arsenal need to be automatic qualifiers for the Champions League. And if they do that, it's not a disaster if they don't make a push for the Premier League. What's a disaster is if they finish fifth or worse. What's a disaster is if they oscillate. Look at Spurs. They leapfrogged Arsenal late on, got in the Champions League. And now they're in a position where they took one step forward, two steps back. Arsenal need to be what Chelsea have been historically. So yeah. we've spoken about Chelsea for quite some time as a successful club. And you can focus on the 21 trophies of Roman Abramovich, but you can also focus in recent years on the fact that even in indifferent seasons, even in average seasons, apart from Mourinho in 2015, 2016, when Leicester won the Premier League, they've been in the Champions League without too much sweat. And in yeah. modern football, I think being an automatic Champions League qualifier is the first thing, which is funny because when you were managing, when you were playing, when Arsene Wenger was managing, he was derided for saying that top four was good. But top four now in modern football, if you're all... Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's an achievement. I know. And they asked you also, would you rather win the FA Cup or would you, would you qualify for Champions League? And what they all said, Champions <laughs> League, please. 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 Yeah. And every fan wants their wants their team in the Champions League. Everyone does. I know. I know. I know. I know. How we put hard to say. It's it's hard because that's what the owners want. They want you in the Champions League. That's what they want you. That's why they want you. Well, they got big wages to pay. Ben, you didn't come up with your fourth side. Who 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 are you coming up with? 
I'm saying Chelsea because Rude's on the show, although we could say Newcastle because Rude's on the show, but I, I, I just don't want to get it. I'm curious about Chelsea. I think it's going to be a tough road also for them. Find their, you know, to find their identity. It's going to be tough, but let's see what they, what's going on. Let's see. Give them a chance. Come on, Chelsea. I, I well, just just I'm not I'm don't need to be nice to Rude, uh, so I'm not putting Chelsea in, and I'm not putting Newcastle in my top four. But I, I'll go City, Arsenal, Liverpool, Man United, and um, and Rude. I'll, I'll pay for the golf next time we play. All right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you are a bandido, you know that. Yeah? Rude, before we let you go, I've got to ask you a random question, a burning question. I've always wanted to know. Taking you back to your young days at Arlen, you then moved to Feyenoord. And as I recollect, you had two options prior to that move. One was Arsenal and one was Ipswich Town. I, 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 do, I don't really know about it. I, I can remember that they were interested in me when I was at home. I, I, I slightly, but I think that our coach uh, at the moment, Barry Hughes, he was a Welshman. He said, no, 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 stay here. You know, you just start. I, I just thought it was just my first year as a, as a professional. So it was too early. I never spoke with anybody of these, but I know, I think that Liam Brady, I think, man, who was it? Somebody there was there to recommend me. I don't know. But that's a long time ago. And, you know, the rest is history. I think I had a nice career. You, you didn't do too badly. <laughs> I don't know what happened to that. Well, yeah. Was there ever a club brood that you would have liked to play for? You either had an offer or you'd have just dreamt of playing for them, but you never got the opportunity. Apart from Bristol City. I don't know. No, I have. I'm very happy with the career I have. I'm really, really proud of what I have achieved. Uh, thanks to good coaches. Thanks to good players around me. I always choose a team that hasn't won a lot. That was my goal. I didn't want to go to a team that already status winnings or every year and everything now I, couldn't, I didn't have a feeling that I could contribute to something so therefore I went to final didn't win for 14 years 12 years something then we got then PSV Eindhoven didn't win for a long time that's what also then to Milan also I think it was also 14 or 12 years that didn't win for a long time that the challenge that I need Chelsea the same thing and I was at Newcastle, and I almost did it. But then I played against the last 15 minutes of... Uh, <laughs> they were too good. I felt that was a good team, by the way. They were they were genuinely a good team when I played against them. I, I, I played it. They had something like five, six players who could score goals easily. So, okay. Ends up, that was a better team than we played. Rudy, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And we really appreciate you coming on. You're welcome. You're a good man. Uh, thanks so much, Rude. Uh, that is your football debrief. Um, a huge thanks uh, to Rude Hullet. As always, our thanks to Fabrizio Romano as well for dropping in. Remember, he'll be here every week giving us his spin on all the transfer dealings around the world. You can find us on Fab Substack, on YouTube, and of course, all your podcast platforms. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye.